Good afternoon. I'm Fred Harris, and I'm a professor of computer science and engineering here at the University of Nevada, Reno, and chair of the Faculty Senate. It's my honor to be here with you today. And before I begin my remarks, I would like to introduce a few special guests who are joining us this afternoon. We have chair of the Board of Regents, Rick Chachok. We have Regent Jason Geddes. Assemblywoman Amber Joyner, and Executive Vice President and Provost Kevin Carmen, And thank you for joining us. <laughs> Today's State of the University Address comes at a pivotal time in our history. When I came to this campus 22 years ago, we had an enrollment slightly below 10,000 students. Today, we're more than 21,000. In many ways, opportunities for our students to achieve in the classroom and for our faculty to excel on the national stage and for our engagement with our community, our region and our state have never been greater. We are seeing people do things that couldn't have been done on our campus before. And yet, we are in the midst of reaching what we can call enthusiastically and perhaps euphemistically critical mass. We are growing at an unprecedented rate, adding record numbers of high achieving students, talented new faculty, and new buildings. Our campus is definitely moving, and the central question for many of us has become, can we keep up? I think we can. We can look at certain pockets on our campus. We have a newly renamed, rebranded, and repurposed medical school. This is an exciting and welcome development. We are seeing the emergence of schools and interdisciplinary programs in key areas that Nevada needs if it is to realize a diversified economy. Nursing, public health, and neuroscience, just to name a few. Our offerings in liberal arts are growing. We are seeing the alignment of academics and research to Nevada's workforce needs with new programs and faculty hires in priority areas. Some of those areas are unmanned autonomous systems, dry land agriculture, and medical diagnostics. Because of this diversification of what we do, we are seeing a connection with our city that has never existed before. Downtown is becoming less of a casino row and more of a startup row. The students in my computer science and engineering courses are graduating and choosing to stay and work here in Northern Nevada because for the first time, our software and hardware development environment is no longer a theory, but a reality. With this unprecedented change has come the attendant challenges. They are challenges that President Johnson is well aware of and will no doubt address here in a few minutes. But what are they? They include broadening our research in such a way that it's inclusive of all the disciplines and stretches across all of our campus. Our PhD production has to be robust in all areas. And we must continue the push that graduate school dean David Zay has championed to increase our graduate enrollment in the coming months and years. We've had quite a building boom on our campus in the recent years. And though we've welcomed the student-centered facilities such as the William N. Pennington Student Achievement Center, and we'll celebrate the opening of the E.L. Wiegand Fitness Center in the spring semester, the fact remains that we are still playing catch up. Deferred maintenance projects must continue to be a priority. And as we add more faculty, we must find them more space, both in the teaching and office space and in the lab space so that they can continue to do their important work. As an aside, it's also important to note that we're not alone in this cycle of infrastructure planning, funding, and implementation. In November, Washoe County Schools have an important ballot measure, WC1. It's the Save Our Schools initiative that speaks to many of the same issues for an educational system that's continually playing infrastructure catch up in a rapidly changing world. As a citizen and a registered voter in Washoe County, I plan on voting for WC1. And I hope all of you here today will join me in adding your yes vote as well. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Here on campus, we must also continue to find ways to reduce our 22 to 1 student to faculty classroom ratio. And as well, we must strive to hire the most diverse and accomplished faculty possible. The simple fact of the matter is, Nevada is changing. Our student body is more diverse than ever before. We must do a better job in establishing faculty that is reflective of our changing state and student body. The Faculty Senate has taken an active role in new faculty retention, and we will continue to work with the administration to find the best ways to mentor our new faculty, while encouraging our veteran faculty to strive even further in their respective fields. These are all major challenges, but I believe that we are capable of meeting them. My reasoning is simple. The university's culture has never been one of, no, we can't do that. But rather it's been a culture of collaboration and support. One of problem solving and strategic thought. One of an abiding belief in the importance of our work. And one of, how can we do this? In May of 1994, I finished my PhD at Clemson University. I remember an advertisement for a job opportunity from the University of Nevada, Reno. It had been faxed. That was the rapid delivery of the time. And a copy had been placed on my desk at Clemson. I had no idea if the University of Nevada, Reno was going to be a keep your suitcase packed, brief stopover, or if it would become my home. I remember my energy view for the job very well. It was early August, right as some new event, hot August nights, was starting. I stayed at a Motel 6. I think that was the only room left in town. I had breakfast at a, for Grand Slam breakfast at a nearby Denny's. And I remember the department I was interviewing with had five members. I enjoyed those people. I remember the campus itself. How should I put it? It was unexpected. It surprised me in every way. And I knew that this was the place for me. 22 years later, I still feel that way. Professionally and personally, I've learned a great deal. My family has grown up here in Northern Nevada. I've had fun, I've worked hard, and I've made lasting relationships and feel like I've had a positive influence on my students. In many ways, I feel like I've grown up here. And interestingly, it feels in some ways that the university has grown up alongside me as well. Perhaps no one understands this sense of growth that our university is experiencing better than our president, Mark Johnson. He has led us down a path that has seen us reemerge from the most challenging time in our history to a period of unprecedented growth and unprecedented institutional achievement. In my dealings with President Johnson, I've always found him to be a thoughtful and engaged listener. He's deliberative in his decision making, but also passionate about our mission. Like so many of us, he sees our university as the key to Nevada's future. He values the work that is done and wants to share our achievements with our community, our region, our state, and our nation. As he put it a few years ago during another State of the University address, the people who come here to study and to work should feel that the work we do is life-affirming and life-changing. I know from my own perspective I couldn't agree more. Now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the 16th president of the University of Nevada, Reno, Dr. Mark Johnson. Thank you, Fred. As is always true with the Faculty Senate, Faculty Senate lays out great challenges. And I think, Fred, you're going to be happy with this address. Welcome to all of the distinguished guests we have here today, friends from the community, colleagues, and students of the University of Nevada, Reno. Thank you for joining me here today. 
Today we're gathered to talk about the state of the University of Nevada, Reno. That's our university. I'm pleased to report to you that all of this university, the state of this university is strong. The university is growing and deepening its impact in every dimension of our mission. Today, I will discuss progress made toward the central big goals and the challenges which lie ahead in the following year. Our central big goals include three. First, to respond to enrollment growth with quality experiential learning and move toward a student to faculty ratio of 18 to one, a median of like universities. Second, to achieve the highest impact research university measured by the Carnegie classification of R1, like so many of our neighboring fine universities. And third, to serve as a pillar of economic development for the new Nevada. Significant progress has been made toward all three of these goals. So let me start with the status of our enrollment growth. Our enrollment growth has gone up by about 1,000 students in each of the last two years. And frankly, that was a bit too fast. This year, we have purposely slowed, but not stopped, the growth of our enrollment to reduce the student to faculty ratio. This slower growth enrollment strategy has seen our fall enrollment increase by 450 students this year to a record 21,353. In parallel with this strategy has been the addition of new faculty members, about 60 additional positions this year. By combining these two approaches, we should see a small reduction in our student to faculty ratio with the intention to enhance both the learning experience and research productivity. From the fall of 2014 to the fall of 2017, we will have added 166 faculty positions on our way to a goal of adding 400 positions by the fall of 2021. Even though the new enrollment figure of 21,353 represents only a 2.2% growth in headcount, student full-time equivalence is up 3.7%, which indicates that students are taking heavier course loads on their way to a four-year degree. In terms of diversity, the proportions of all students of color have gone up from 35% to 36%. Considering the portion of Hispanic Latino enrollment alone, this group has grown from 17% to 18.5%. Already, Patricia Richard, our Chief Diversity Officer, has a campus group preparing us for the path to becoming a Hispanic-serving institution. <laughs> the student population remains at 70% Nevada residents. Freshman to sophomore retention remains at a very high level of 81%. Four-year graduation rates remain at 26%, but our six-year graduation rate dipped a bit to 54%. But fortunately, over the last five years, the, our six-year graduation rate has been on a healthy upward trend. I'd like to recognize the work of our student services units, led by Shannon Ellis, Vice President for Student Services. These units... <laughs> Thank you. These units explicitly have opened up the doors of the university to all communities of qualified students and provide the academic and social support to help all of our students reach their goal. So thank you for recognizing all of the people in Shannon's departments. Not only do we have more students, they're coming to us better prepared. Education across our K-12 school system is profoundly important. I want to take this opportunity as a citizen of Washoe County to emphasize the need for continued investment in our school system. WC1, also known as Save Our Schools Initiative, makes a commitment to the future of our students. 
I support making education a priority, and personally, I will be voting for WC1. <laughs> Turning from student enrollment to research, the university is focused on achieving the highest Carnegie research classification. Research universities are vibrant generators of income flow into a region. They attract a stable flow of faculty, students, and industry. They are generators of intellectual properties, which serve as a catalyst for new industry. They are a significant contributor to economic development and well-being. Recently, we contracted with Applied Analysis, a consulting firm in Las Vegas. By comparing the economic impacts of the University of 2015, with the expected investments that would align this university with aspirant R1 classified universities, the study estimates are as follows. The university's generation of jobs will rise from almost 11,000 to almost 13,000 jobs. By becoming an R1 university and making these investments, we will be adding 2,000 jobs to this community. An increase in total economic output, which is now about $1.1 billion for this community, will rise to $1.4 billion. That's an increase of $300 million a year in output for this community. These huge economic impacts don't count the benefits of the more than 4,000 graduates we produce each year. These numbers do not account for the value of the new and improved businesses which benefit from the results of research. And they do not account for the value the public reaps from safer bridges, better health diagnostics, and the public benefits of research and education. The goal of reaching the Carnegie R1 classification remains one of our top priorities. And I can provide several measures of progress toward that goal. The university has experienced accelerating growth in research expenditures from 87 million in, F, in fiscal year 13 to 94 million last year. And that's a 9% growth in three years and a 5% growth in just the last year. Numbers of doctoral graduates are measured as part of the R1 criteria. And growth in master's enrollment from last year to this year is up 3.7%, and growth in doctoral, doctoral enrollment is up 5.5% over last year to a level of 830 doctoral students. Graduate student enrollment comes, growth comes in part from increased grant awards, adding more graduate teaching assistant positions, and raising the base annual graduate stipend from $14,000 to $17,000 over the last two years to be more competitive in the graduate student marketplace. We have far to go with the graduate program, and I'll address more of that a little bit later. Additional faculty positions are critical to research growth. We are proud to have added these 166 positions to our faculty roster from fall 2014 to fall 2017. And we are committed to making 80% of our new faculty positions tenure track lines. And this will assure growth across the full range of university missions of teaching, research, and engagement. Along with faculty growth, we are adding GTA lines and administrative support lines. And in the future, we will be adding as many GTA lines as we do faculty positions. Our Vice President for Research and Innovation, Myrtle Gautam, has been actively developing university infrastructure to support this research progress. Dr. Ellen Purpose has been named as the new Assistant Vice President for Enterprise and Innovation. She will oversee the development of enhanced enterprise and commercialization services on campus, including technology transfer, such as patents, licensing, startups, spin-offs, and corporate relations. Also reporting to Ellen are the Nevada Industry Excellence, NVIE, and the Nevada Center for Applied Research, NCAR. NVIE is the statewide manufacturing extension partnership hosted by the university, 
which helps Nevada companies by providing resources to improve processes, efficiencies, and productivity. NCAR is a standalone applied research and technology center focused on making Nevada businesses internationally competitive by leveraging the laboratories and intellectual assets of the university. We invite businesses in. These new functions and leaders bring extensive experience at the nexus of discovery and commercialization to put the innovation in Myrtle Gautam's title of Vice President for Research and Innovation. Other elements have been put in place to encourage both research and innovation. Last December, our Board of Regents approved a proposal to add entrepreneurship to the list of accomplishments which can be considered for tenure. Currently, di the Digital Measures Individual Evaluation Measurement Tool is being modified to allow entrepreneurship activity to count in annual and tenure evaluations. Frequently, we mention Drs. Tom Kozell, David Alcoin, and Dean Birkin in the School of Medicine as individuals who have commercialized their intellectual properties and actually started businesses on campus based upon their research. The university has a very encouraging royalty incentive policy, so I urge faculty to use this policy to develop businesses based upon your own research. It will help you personally and help the area for economic development. Positioning the university to further commercialization impact, the Nevada Research and Innovation Corporation, NVRIC, has been formed as a new, a new organization which is somewhat similar to the research foundations found at other R1 universities. NVRIC will expedite movement of the University of Nevada Reno research discoveries and intellectual property to the marketplace for commercialization. A, a commercial, to commercialize products and services that will benefit the public. Laying this groundwork, whether it is in commercialization of new technology, creating new innovation-based businesses, or cultivating a culture of entrepreneurship in the research arena, requires creativity, diligence, and vision. So please join me in applauding all of those individuals who are involved in this important effort. A third big goal is the role we play in serving as a catalyst for economic development. A highlight of last year was the opening of the University of Nevada Reno Innovation Center, powered by SWITCH. From January through August of this year, 342 events took place at the Innovation Center. These events included community, university, and business groups, along with economic development agencies. As I have traveled in Europe and Australia in the last few years, I have learned that this type of collaborative space is becoming an important element of the nexus between the universities, governments, and the entrepreneurial communities across the world. And had we not captured this opportunity now, our region would be behind in an important part of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Not only this center, but expanded relationships with the university, between the university and EDON, the Governor's Office of Economic Development, the City of Reno, and numerous businesses and agencies have take, taken place and put the university as a vital catalyst for economic development. Mike Kazmierski, President and CEO of EDON, wrote in the RGJ recently that the University of Nevada Reno is the engine of economic development in Northern Nevada. Students too are very involved in community outreach. For the second straight year, our student athletes were recognized by the Mountain West Conference as having contributed the most public service hours of any Mountain West school. Our student government has started a program called Give Pulse, an online interface designed to connect students and faculty and staff at, in Nevada with nonprofit organizations in our community and engage in volunteerism, 
and service learning. This contributes to experiential learning as students have a direct impact on their communities and this interface also allows the university to connect students to the needs of our community and connect their classroom work with experiential learning. Our students expect to engage 3,000 individual volunteers by the end of the semester. So to all of those who have done so much in building a stronger bridge to our community, I say thank you. So please join me in congratulating all this effort. So now we get to Fred's question. With so much going on, and with so much growth defining our work, you are all probably wondering, like Fred did, how in the world are we going to handle this growth? <clears throat> well, I noted earlier that our student population is growing and that the university has responded by growing the numbers of faculty, staff, graduate students, and support positions. But where do we put all these people? Well, our Associate Vice President of Administration and Finance and Budget Director, Bruce Shively, along with the Institutional Research Office, developed a capacity study several years ago. And the study showed that the physical capacity enhancements, which we would be needing to accommodate this growth, were many. And, but we have followed this plan. The study showed that our greatest needs will be in office space and research laboratories. Provost Kevin Carman has initiated class scheduling plans to maximize the utilization of classroom and class laboratory spaces, and these operational strategies are preventing the necessity of building classroom buildings for a while. But to accommodate student demand for housing, we opened the Graduate Family Housing Facility two years ago. Peavine Freshman Residence Hall in the fall of 2015, and the Great Basin Hall, mostly for freshmen, will open in the fall of 2018. In terms of office spaces, we emptied the Continuing Education Building when extended studies moved to the Redfield campus and the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges moved off campus. So marketing and communications, the University of Nevada Press, institutional analysis, scheduling, 365 learning, and the equal opportunity and Title IX office moved into that space. After the William N. Pennington Student Achievement Center opened in February, the, a, a number of the offices moved to the new building and opened up space for additional space moves. Lincoln Hall was converted from a residence hall to office space for history, sociology, and communication studies. Thompson Hall, which opens again in March, is being renovated for political science, English, gender, race, and identity, core humanities, and the College of Liberal Arts Advising Center. The Savitt Library has been converted for, to office space for the public health section of community health sciences. And philosophy has moved from Kane Hall to the Jones Visitor Center. Palmer Engineering has been closed for the year as it gets a complete renovation to increase the number and quality of offices and research labs for engineering. The EL Wiegand Fitness Center is moving along nicely. It will open early in 2017, providing 108,000 square feet of additional health and fitness facilities. The Ansari Business Building has been updated with renovations and the 15th Street entrance to the campus has been redesigned and repaved. Athletics has completely renovated Mackey Stadium with chair back seats, a new track surface, a new scoreboard and sound system, and a stadium club, which brings the stadium into the 21st century for fan experience just as Mackey Stadium celebrates its 50th anniversary. Athletics has also put in a new six-court outdoor tennis facility, which has been needed for more than a decade. And as soon as the EL Wiegand Fitness Center opens, the basketball courts in Lombardi will be transitioned to athletics to serve as a basketball practice facility for women's and men's basketball. 
I'm especially proud to, of the attention given to the basic infrastructure of this aging campus. The university has implemented a plan to establish a central chilling plant comprised of three 550 ton chillers to provide a single chilled water loop for 28 buildings. Hot water and electrical power loops also are being updated. And this basic infrastructure is a sound investment. It's going to serve the campus well with uninterrupted services of cooling, heating, and electricity for the next two or three decades. There are three more future projects that are well along in planning and fundraising. <clears throat> First, the Act II Arts Building is a 38,000 square foot faci facility, including additional and improved practice and performance spaces for music and art. Conceptual design and fundraising are nearly complete for this building, which could open in summer 2018. Construction designs have begun for an 87,000 square foot engineering building, and fundraising is well underway. I'll return to that in a moment. And finally, the conceptual design has been done for a College of Business building, which will be located in the Gateway area south of the campus and north of I-80. This project will move forward as soon as we finish the engineering building. Since 2011, the campus has experienced a total of $387 million in facility improvements, and just less than 24 million was in state funds. Student capital improvement fees, grants, donor gifts, and sales of unused property have made the pace of construction move at the speed that you've witnessed. Although there are many units involved in this effort, I'd like to single out two in particular to give our gratitude. First, thanks to the leadership of Vice President for Development and Alumni Relations, John Carruthers, and the work of his entire unit, we are engaged actively in a comprehensive campaign that is helping us realize many of the important needs of the campus. And second, I wish to recognize the high level and high quality of performance of facility services and the entire administration and finance unit under the direction of Vice President Ron Zurich for creative planning, design, contracting, real estate, and financial services that make all of this possible. Please join me in thanking all these individuals for their efforts. Because of the totality of this effort, the University of Nevada, Reno is being recognized as a fast-paced contributor to economic diversification of Nevada and a top quality place for learning and research. As the presentation illustrates, we have an exciting future. And coupled with this excitement, we'll face some challenges. The university will be working in the next year on a number of specific challenges. Let me start with the upcoming legislative session. The Board of Regents has an aggressive proposal for higher education. The Regents' first priority is to obtain faculty salary enhancement equivalent to other state employees. We're all hoping this comes in the form of a merit raise. Another top priority is to honor the higher education funding formula. The formula entails caseload growth, which results in an additional funding at a fixed dollar amount for each additional weighted student credit hour completed. With our enrollment growth and high rate of successful course completions, this means that the state fund revenue to the university should grow significantly. Another priority is to support capacity enhancement at all of the NCHI institutions. Our university proposal focuses on faculty, staff, and equipment infrastructure to support additional capacity for education and research in advanced manufacturing. This objective fits the Governor's Office of Economic Development's recognition that Nevada's growth, and especially growth in northern Nevada, will be in knowledge-based industry, which is identified broadly 
has advanced manufacturing. The university is especially focused on a capital improvement request for the state to finance half of the cost of a new building for the College of Engineering. This project rose to the top of the region's priority list for new construction. We completed a great amount of planning and design, which normally would be supported by the state with a planning grant. The proposal is for the state to fund half and the university to fund half of the post-design project cost, or about $41.5 million each. We already have had success in, identif in identifying the institutional funds and fundraising to position this project well for the governor's and the legislature's consideration. Since the enrollment in the College of Engineering has been the largest of any college, research expenditures are second only to the medical school, and the graduation of engineers is so critical to the workforce needs of industries in Nevada. Capacity expansion for education and research in engineering is critical. Responding to greater diversity on campus is another important challenge. Diversity will receive significant attention this year. As noted earlier, the proportion of our students from ethnically diverse backgrounds continues to increase. Over the past several months, our university's senior leadership has been actively engaged with our students and student leadership to ensure that our campus remains a safe and welcoming place. We've ha also had small group discussions with students from various categories of diversity to find out how we can make this a more comfortable place to work and to study. As a campus community, are we sensitive to how people raised in black, Latino, or Native American families perceive messages, instruction, and identification? Are we sensitive to the challenges that hearing, sight, and physically impaired individuals have? Are we sensitive to what it is like to be gay or transgender in a class setting? or a laboratory? Are we sensitive to what it is like after several years deployed in a hostile combat environment to return to school where most of the students in class are younger and less experienced? Over the next few months and years, voluntary learning opportunities will be made available to build understanding for everyone and about the appreciation for people from a wide range of backgrounds. Already, Safe Zone Ally training has been available to help our students and colleagues develop a better understanding of how people in the LGBTQIA community experience college. A second level course is being composed now. During the fall, the course Becoming Culturally Responsive Professionals is being offered in, as an initial discussion in creating a welcoming academic environment. Our VetSmart training is available to help understand the unique challenges of our veterans students. While these trainings are strictly voluntary, I urge you to take advantage of these sessions to build an understanding of not only the diversity we have on the campus, but of the ways individuals in these diverse groups are affected by identity, assignments, comments, and how to assure inclusion of everyone in class, social, and work settings. To do all of our jobs most effectively, it's not enough to know our numbers about diversity, but we have to be aware of how our recognition of identity, our language, our teaching formats, and our work environments can add to genuine, comfortable inclusion of everyone in the university community. I'd like to recognize all those who are individually and collectively involved in this focused effort to make our campus more inclusive. Please join me in acknowledging their effort. Additional challenges will be occupying our effort in the coming year. It's important that the university take more seriously the hiring of a more diverse faculty. As the proportion of our students who are of color increases, 
Our faculty composition also must change to reflect the student population and to help us all build stronger relationships between students and faculty. Another challenge is continuing growth of contract and grant revenue. This is essential for progress toward the higher impact research portfolio. We will need continuous design, finance, and construction of laboratory facility improvements. Strategic growth in graduate education programs also is essential as we grow faculty and move toward a higher research profile. Graduate recruitment will take study, financial commitments to stipends and professional recruiting, and marketing in key disciplines. The medical school will be implementing a transformation plan whereby the medical departments in Southern Nevada will transition to the new UNLV Medical School while the UNR School of Medicine develops a full four-year curriculum in Reno, creates additional graduate medical education opportunities in Northern Nevada, generates a strong clinical research program, and starts a new physician's assistant degree program. I'd like to take a moment now to thank our colleagues in Southern Nevada for being a part of our university because they will be transitioning to UNLV and we wish them well in the transition. As we continue this transformation of the medical school, our marketing effort uh, of the whole campus, our marketing effort will be important to let the nation and the world know of the progress that we are making. Marketing is essential to build the knowledge of our reputation which reflects our true qualities. One such effort is the Powered by Knowledge campaign that was launched in the summer in an effort to raise awareness of the impact of our university. Our reputation will affect student and faculty recruiting as well as our US News and World Report ranking in the Best Colleges edition. Athletics is now in the fifth year uh, in association with the Mountain West Conference and athletic director Doug Newth has taken on many challenges and the entire athletic team has improved recruiting, facilities, staffs, and performance, largely in a self-supporting way. Throughout this period, athletes have maintained very strong academic and graduation performance to reflect pride on this university. And our final challenge, there are many, the final one I'll list today, is that financial resources are always an issue in a fast-paced growth environment. And we would like to have state funding to assist us with facilities, student caseload growth, and faculty salaries. But our growth cannot wait on the next state dollar. We have to be entrepreneurial and generate most of our resource growth to match our needs. We have many examples of university operations growing self-generating revenue to sustain new and existing programs. Like a partnership with a private firm to offer online degrees with significant expected net revenues, this is starting in social work and moving on to a Master of Public Health. The medical school is developing a new financial model in collaboration with Renown Health to make the offering of medical services more self-sufficient. Much of the building and infrastructure improvements have been financed by sales of lesser used assets with funds redirected to higher value uses on the campus. As a university, we must set high priority goals and figure out how to finance these projects and programs. This is a time for our university to act like entrepreneurs to design valuable programs, apply good business plans, and sustain these programs. As I said in the beginning of this address, the state of the university is strong. We are recognized as a university on the move. We are all in this exciting time of growth and heightened impact together. We are all contributors. We genuinely are in this together. Our reputations are interlinked. Your professional output and recognition reflects well 
on the university. And the collective improvement of the university's reputation reflects on you. The state of the university is strong because our productivity, our cohesion around our core values and missions, our cultures of student success and collaboration, and our attitudes of friendliness displayed by our people are all strong. Thank each of you and all of you for building this remarkable university. Thank you for coming.